Welcome to Coming Home, Survive and Thrive in Homeschooling. I am privileged to be interviewing the Right Reverend Professor N. T. Wright, although he introduces himself as Tom, and is one of the world's leading New Testament scholars and a world authority on the Apostle Paul. He is the author of over 80 academic and lay-level books, such as Surprised by Hope and The Day the Revolution Began. Wright is ordained in the Church of England and is currently at Whitcliffe Hall, Oxford. I asked Tom how he could advise homeschooling families in preparing for a vocation in biblical research and theology, which subjects, languages and books are important. He does this well and offers plenty of study insights that equip young and older students all through their lives. A good theological foundation is for anyone, not just those with a vocation in sight. Our conversation is in the Western Cafe by the Bodleian Library, Oxford. Although I chose the quietest place, there are background sounds of people coming and going. Fortunately, the high quality of his insight and responses will more than compensate. After our interview, I will include his email response on courage, as we didn't get to talk about this over coffee. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm so excited to hear what you've got to say about recommendations for homeschooling families. There's so many of them who know your name, are familiar with your books, so yeah. this can only be good. Well, can you start by explaining what it is you do? Like, Have you got like an elevator pitch that you would go, okay, this? I'm basically a biblical scholar who loves the subject matter and tries to clarify it for the next generation. Well, that's a brilliant elevator pitch. Is, is that all right? <laughs> Will that do? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, the kind of second paragraph to that would be that the older I get, the more I'm aware of how many things that I grew up with, assumptions about what the Christian faith was, are, are not entirely wrong, but need quite serious adjustment in the light of what the Bible is actually saying. And see, I have a always had a strong view of the Bible, unlike some theologians who are happy to go with things that they've got from later on, from the 5th century or the 15th century or the 16th century or whatever, and then fit in bits of the Bible where it will work. And I've always tried to go with, let's actually make sure we've understood the story the Bible's telling first, and then see how the developments go on from there. So getting to know the Bible like the back of one's hand has to be absolutely foundational. Can you please explain why this level of scholarship is important to the church? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, you know, people have said about John's Gospel, but it's true of the Bible as a whole, that John's Gospel is a pool which is deep enough for an elephant to swim in and safe enough for a child to paddle in. And when I was Bishop of Durham, I wanted my clergy to be as well-educated theologically as they could be, because for the needs of the next generation it won't do just to go on parroting the same things that we've always heard you have to be able to keep up with the curve or however you want to put it and there should be always plenty of teachers in the church who are able to do that and able to take on new challenges and you know whether it's the challenge of artificial intelligence or whether it's the challenge of Richard Dawkins and people whatever to take on those challenges and meet them on their own ground and do better than that at the same time Uh, There were always some clergy, some people that I ordained, who God had called in midlife from other walks of life entirely and who had a deep pastoral sense of how to look after people in a particular parish, whatever, who were never going to be great theologians, who were never going to read Greek, who were never going to do this, that and the other, but who were much loved pastors in their own communities. And I'm very happy to ordain people within a larger structure of what the church as a whole is. In other words, not everyone in ministry can do all the things that ministry has to do. So, but we we have to have at least some in every generation who can actually understand what's going on in the wider intellectual culture, um, in the theological fields, in the biblical studies field, and can talk sense about it. 
and we won't all get it all right um, but at least we can we, we don't have to roll over and say oh well somebody said last week that Jesus never said X, Y, or Z, so we've just got to accept that. No, we don't have to accept that. We, we have to go at it and do better. Um, but as I say, not all clergy, not all church leaders, not all teachers in a church can have that expertise. Um, we need pastoral expertise. We need people to be out there in the world doing other things. So we've got to have a balance. But in, as part of that, and I'm saying this strongly because in the Church of England at the moment, I don't think there are any bishops on the bench of bishops who have got, um, may, maybe there's one or two with PhDs, but there are, there are none who would be university professor level. Mm. And that's a risk, actually, in terms of theological leadership within the church, mm. um, that you then, if you don't have that leadership, you sink back into pragmatism. You know, how can we get around this corner? How can we solve this crisis? How can we put out this fire? Without actually having the larger picture. So, mm -hmm. so if we sketch backwards, like you just mentioned that you're looking for those that are PhD level with that thinking and academic ability. So if we go backwards into homeschooling yeah, life, yeah. and I think we might have mentioned that for the most part homeschoolers have a privilege of being able to curate mm -hmm. the curriculum. So it means you can get um, a head start if you like. Yeah, yeah. So if there's a sense in the parents as well as the as, as maybe even the older children that this could be their vocation. Yeah. And even if it isn't, they could go on to bless themselves and the church. Yeah, yeah. What what would you recommend to the family and how to prepare? Again, it's horses for courses. Um, thinking of myself and my siblings and my cousins and so on, I've been fascinated as life has gone on to see who got which genes and who had a natural ability to do this and that and the other. And I once complained to my mother that my cousin Michael, who is five years older than me, was absolutely brilliant, still is brilliant with his hands. He can make anything. He can take planks of wood and turn them into anything at all and make lovely cabinets. And he built half his own home and goodness knows what. I remember saying, how come Michael got all those genes? Because that came from my great-grandfather and my grandfather, who were both very, very gifted, and my father too, in a way. And my mother looked at me and said, yes, dear, but how many books has Michael written? <laughs> <laughs> so I find, okay, okay. Um, so, you know, there's no point taking somebody who is going to be a brilliant carpenter, engineer, etc., etc., and trying to make them an expert in sort of Ugaritic and Hebrew and so on. At the same time, there are probably far more children out there who could really get hold of Latin and Greek and maybe Hebrew and so on and relish it and enjoy it. Mm. One of my grandchildren who's at school just down the road here has in the choir at New College, which is one of the men and boys choirs here, he just started, he's seven, and he is, he's got to do some music theory. And I was thinking, oh, good, how's he going to take to, take to that? Apparently, he absolutely loves it. He just loves organising the notes and seeing how they wow. work and so on. He's got a natural, uh, like a, math a mathematical interest in how the language of music works. Wonderful, great. Not all children are like that. Not all musicians are like that, actually. So one has to go with the flow while challenging, etc. So having said that, my sense with music and languages is that the sooner the better. Unfortunately, the Anglophone world forgets that children are hardwired to learn lots of languages. You know, a child growing up in Belgium or Holland, probably by the time they're 10, speaks German, French, Flemish, English, etc., etc. Think nothing of it. Um, when I've lived in the Middle East from time to time, um, little boy coming to sell you postcards will guess at your nationality and speak to you in Norwegian or German or French or Spanish or whatever and as well as English they, they know enough to get by and and they themselves will speak Hebrew and Arabic and, and probably local dialects as well so there's no reason why m far more children can't learn far more languages than we've normally given them and even if they don't keep them up it's a very good mental training anyway, and I would say the sooner you start them on Latin and Greek, the better. So what um, age are you thinking of? Uh, five, six, seven. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I started Latin at eight, and uh, Latin and French at eight, and I didn't start Greek till I was 13, and I wish I'd started it a lot younger. 
It's the same as learning scales and arpeggios on the piano. Somebody who does that at age seven, eight, nine, whatever, they will they will often enjoy it. It's it, like my grandson. It's a kind of an exercise to be doing it. You don't want to wait till you're a teenager. When you're a teenager, you want to be playing Schubert and Mozart and so on. And when you're a teenager, you want to be able to read the great poets. You don't want to be learning the nuts and bolts of the language. You want to have that already in in the back. This is hugely counterintuitive to so many people in the Anglosphere because we just assume we can get by with English and hope for the best. In terms of Latin, Greek, Hebrew, because our own language is subtly changing all the time and will change from culture to culture, from New Zealand to America to England, whatever, we've always got to be working at translation, at paraphrase, at saying trying to get our heads round what Paul really was saying in Romans 4 or what that is the Hebrews were saying in the crucial chapter 9 or this sort of thing no one translation will do it we've got to be working at that and pushing the boundaries otherwise the words will change and slip this way and that and people won't get it or they will hear it in the wrong register so that that's an ongoing task and as a Bible translator myself you know i Everything I've done is purely provisional <laughs> for a generation, for a time. Well then, when it comes to uh, choosing literature, yeah, really yeah. good books, classical studies and history, what do you think is important for parents to be including when they're curating? Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the great, the great classics, I, I would love to think of children at a comparatively early age finding their way through presumably initially in translation through Homer, you know, just to have the Iliad and the Odyssey as part of their mental furniture mm. and Virgil, the Aeneid, etc., etc. Anything that's introducing them to a larger vision of how people saw the world and history and so on and you can discuss it this way and that, but actually you've got to have the roughage, you've got to have the information. Obviously the Bible itself is the most extraordinary large-scale story and knowing the story as a whole and knowing the bits and pieces is endlessly, endlessly fascinating. And again, one can't start too soon. And curiously, I see here on the table in front of us, The Hobbit, <laughs> as Tolkien, an illustrated version of The Hobbit. When my oldest son was just seven, we got on a boat and went to Canada. We emigrated by ship, amazingly. He was seasick all the way from Land's End to Newfoundland. And to comfort him, we read him The Hobbit uh, which we happened to have with us. He was just seven. When we got to Canada, the house we were renting, uh, he discovered that the same chap had written a rather larger book called The Lord of the Rings. And we were trying to say, you know, well, maybe in a few years' time, he wasn't going to be put off. He read it twice through that autumn wow. <laughs> and, and has been a Tolkien geek ever since he's now 50. <laughs> And because it's it's a world, it's and, and many seven-year-olds can take on that sort of thing. I, I once was in America, met some children who who were being homeschooled. I remember a pair of sisters that I was introduced to, who were I think fourteen and sixteen, something like that, and they were talking about the great books program that they were in. And so I said rather cautiously, said, oh, "So what are the great books for you?" Unhesitatingly, they were talking about Dostoevsky, they were talking about Aristotle, they were talking about stuff that. I would have thought, my goodness, you've got to be at least 18, 19, 20 to get this going. But no, there's no reason why young people can't be led into this. They don't have to be a baby. Well, you said earlier, the sooner the better. Yeah, in, in all sorts of ways, yes, yes. Mm. But but again, it's, it's, it's not for everybody. Yeah, I've got four children, they're very, very different characters. Mm. Um, only two of them have degrees. Um, the other two, I've had to say to them, look, getting a university degree is not the sign that you're a good person, a good human being. Some of the smartest, nicest, best people I know left school at 14 or 15. And some of the most dysfunctional humans I know are Oxford Dons. <laughs> so, so, it's, so I'm not an academic snob, far from it. <laughs> but, but where people can be challenged, then often they can go much further than we imagine. Same, same with music, as I say, having had both my sons singing in the in the great choral tradition, looking at the Sheldonian Theatre over there. I remember watching younger son singing treble in a performance of Handel's Messiah over there with Prince Charles in the in the audience, um, and realizing 
that when you train a child in a choir like that, by the time they're 12, they know there is such a thing as excellence and they know it's within reach, and, which is a remarkable thing. Many, many people go right through their lives without ever realizing that. And for a child to, to understand that deeply in their bones from an early age is, is a terrific thing. They know it's within reach. Okay, I can work at this. We can, we can get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So whatever the view. Yes, and, and often we find in the homeschooling um, life that the parents are the ones that know their children the best who's gifted in yeah. in a particular field like you say who is not going to be yeah. destined yeah. for university yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that because absolutely. god creates absolutely and the cleverest oxford don is still going to need a tradesman to come in to plumber's house <laughs> everybody's gifted absolutely in, in absolutely. different ways it's absolutely. identifying it and yeah yeah, yeah. I, when we lived in canada we had good friends in the church and he the chap um, was, was a handyman and uh, they became good friends and he said to me he'd been helping me with something I think I was finishing off the basement in the house where we lived and he came and basically showed me how to do stuff and he said at one point he said of course I'm not clever like you he said when I was at school they always said oh you know you're never going to pass exams etc and I said Tony you're just as clever as me I have watched how you've selected exactly the right tool to do this job and exactly the right angle for that I said you're processing stuff just as fast as I am it's just different stuff I'm happy to say God then called him to the ministry he's now had a second career as, as a clergyman in Western Canada so God moves in many mysterious ways but um and one of the nastiest things we can do to young people is tell them they're no good, you know, mm, because cool. they don't match up to this or that. Or that. Yeah. It's one of the biggest lies you can pass on mm, to a child. Mm, mm, it's mm. not true. I was going to ask you, Tom, one of the things that we return to over and over in, in what we do is the importance of training a child how to think and not mm, what mm, to mm, think. Mm. So. As you reflect over your own education and what you see yeah. happening now, do you have anything to say on your own observations, your own experience, and what you would recommend? <laughs> That's a great question, because in a sense, without some subject matter, then how to think feels very abstract. But also one wants to say that within what we loosely call postmodernity, the question of how to think has been discounted because the only thing that seems to matter is how you feel so my truth and your truth and fake news and all that without collapsing back into a sterile rationalism we need to be able to talk about and think about truth about what is actually the case and I see this flowing directly from the biblical doctrine of God as creator that, that the, the truth of God's good creation is foundational and for the Christian, the truth of the new creation, the redemption of the original creation and its attaining God's original intent for it, this is, a, for me, the foundation of all... And I say for me because we all, we all do that, but in a sense that's funny. It's the foundation of all truth and learning to think in tune with truth is absolutely vital. Otherwise, we're just wandering around in a fog and interpersonal discourse collapses, political discourse collapses, that's going on as we speak in Ukraine, in Gaza, uh, all over the place in this country, in, in America, heaven help us. Uh, as somebody who goes to America still a certain amount, I watch with mm. something approaching terror at the thought of <laughs> what could happen there this year with their election. But, but the, the confusions there are just multiple. One of the things that I learnt when I was at school from a rather strange master who was actually a clergyman and was, was a bit of a maverick and we didn't we none of us really knew what to make of him. But one day he stopped whatever he was supposed to be teaching us and, and taught us a bit about how to think. He showed us how to do our own mind maps, how to take a subject, whatever it was, take a large sheet of paper and write one word in the middle of it, stare at that word, and then start to write down one side all the words that you associated with it, all the things, the ideas that came to you. And then as that's going on, as you look at that, what are you aware of that seems to be coming in on the edge of this picture and is 
coming from a different angle and put that over some, somewhere else in the sheet of paper and let that process go on for a bit. Then put it aside and come back to it an hour or two later or a day or a week later. And this time start with the odd thing that was creeping up on the side and see what then happens to it. And you get a different range of... That's basically still what I do when I'm mapping out an article or a book or whatever. It, it, it isn't a passport to truth, but it's a, it's a, a trick to get you into understanding a subject and understanding your own approach to a subject etc etc and I've, I've often said this to my graduate students when they want to be writing something and I've, the other thing I say is when you're writing a paper or, or an essay or a book whatever it is think first about your seven-year-old nephew saying what are you writing about you give a, a short simple one-liner that's your basic heading then you imagine your 12 year old niece saying yes but what's that actually about that might give you two or three other lines and then move up through the teams and the last person in that list is your professor most students start with what is my professor expecting me to say and then you get a mass of oh dear I, I should be doing this should be doing that too. and you don't get any clarity at all if you're not careful but to, to start with the, with the simple thing and map it out from there. And again, I still I still do that when I'm roughing out a chapter, whatever. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, oh, absolutely. You, you've honed that, that one over life and you know it works. Well, so, yeah, it, it, yes. And, and it's always subject to revision. Um, and you come back and say, yes, but, <clears throat> but in principle. So what do you think of the idea that, that, if a, that if a student would like to further their vocation, seriously aim for a vocation and, or a biblical researcher, uh, is, is there any merit in either bypassing some of the current university system and using mentors and private education? Uh, you, you're indicating that you might have it's, given this some thought already. It, well, it's, so. it's tricky. It's tricky. Again, it, it, it depends. I obviously was educated right here, in fact, just there is Exeter College, which was my undergraduate college, and in the Oxford tutorial system, each week you write uh, an essay, a paper, for your tutor, and you go one-on-one, -on -one and you read the essay out 20 minutes, and then you have 40 minutes discussion, and the tutor pulls it apart, and, and so on and so forth. That's a wonderful system at one level. Having also taught in the American system, the Canadian system, I often have been a bit jealous that I was never part of a really buzzy class at Harvard or Yale or Princeton or somewhere where there would be 15 or 20 of you and there would be a lot of competition and interplay between you. I mean, we, my, my fellow students and I would get together from time to time and discuss the essays we were writing. We didn't do it nearly enough and there was no system for doing that. Um, and I think actually there's a lot to be said f for that learning in a peer group um, comparing notes and you know what, what, what did you make of this and so on and so forth but very exciting at the moment watching my oldest grandson who's in his first year at Cambridge reading English and obviously absolutely relishing it and particularly being in precisely a small group of six or eight in his college where they've all read the same Shakespeare play this week and they're now all going at it and oh, I just love the thought of him, him doing that. Um, so, so the mentor thing, it, it's, it's a great system, but you probably want a mixed economy, is what I would say. And of course it'll depend on the mentor. Not all mentors know how to enable different students with different aptitudes to get the best out of them, etc. One, one of the main things is to find your way through the things that you enjoy reading so that you are led by your own desire not just by oh well I've got to read this this week you know that's that's when things really take off when the student realizes that well I was told to read this and this and this well I've done that but actually I discover that there's that and that and that as well wow I need to go to the library and dive into that so, it, but, but I mean, the, the world of biblical studies and theology is so huge and multiform these days. It used to be the case that you could divide the theological world into basically those who believed all the stuff and those who either didn't or were trying to trim it down. It's much more complicated than that now, and I think 
that may just be that I'm more aware of complexities that were always there but which weren't so apparent when I was younger that those of us who were firm believers were desperate to defend our corner and anything that was saying something different that, that was sort of dangerous liberals so we had to fight them off but now I would say a lot of people who are basically orthodox are nevertheless I would see it drifting down the platonic path or whatever and there are battles to be fought at different levels and sometimes battles between equally devout believers from different traditions that we need to engage for the health of the church for our own health but but as far as I'm concerned obviously a good strong detailed working knowledge of the whole Bible is, is pretty darn basic you probably know the book that Mike Bird and I did a few years ago called the New Testament in its world the, the way that book worked was that Mike Bird who's Australian and based in Melbourne he went right through my oeuvre boiled it down into a single volume, added all sorts of maps and charts and diagrams and timelines and so on, did it brilliantly. I then had to read through what he'd done because there was a certain amount of Australianism in it which I wanted, since since it was going to be quoted with, um, with my name attached, I thought yeah. we'd better just tone this down a bit. But Mike's a great guy and he did an amazing job. And that book has done quite well in the last few years, I think it's been out four or five years now, but as a basic intro to, well, what it says, the New Testament in its world. And so from my point of view, to understand the Bible, you have to understand the world of Greece and Rome, and particularly the first century Jewish world. And people often say to me, how can I understand the first century Jewish world? And my, my usual answer is read Josephus. And Josephus, the great Jewish historian from the second half of the first century, book is readily, his books are readily available in Penguin Classics, The Jewish War or the Jewish Antiquities. And I always say to people, Josephus is a funny old stick, but he was there. He was living in Jerusalem in the middle of the first century. He was there in Jerusalem when Paul came back from his missionary journeys and there was a riot. I mean, Josephus doesn't mention Paul and Paul doesn't mention Josephus, but it was a small world. And to understand the dynamics of that world is teaches you so much. Um, and most theologians, in my experience, systematic theologians, don't really understand the Jewish world because the, the Western tradition has been, oh, well, Judaism, that's works righteousness, so we don't go there. Mm. So therefore, we try to understand Christianity in terms of Greek thought, hence mm. Plato, etc. Um, and that process started quite early, by the third century. That was, that was underway. But actually, the New Testament won't yield its secrets unless we think of it Jewishly. And then Jewish within the Greco-Roman world. Mm. Uh, my big book on Paul was deliberately mapped out that way, the, the different worlds, um, Judaism, Greco-Roman politics, ancient religion, etc. So those recommendations are really helpful because otherwise there's just a bit of a shotgun approach, you know, homeschooling parents might be going, great ideas, but what am I, I know, going to I know, get? I know, I know. I mean, I've always been fascinated by Qumran ever since I first studied the Dead Sea Scrolls. And one of the exciting things about Qumran is you can actually go to Jerusalem and see the scrolls themselves in the Israel Museum. Have, have you been to Jerusalem? Oh, oh, for those of us who studied the Bible all our lives, the earliest manuscripts we've got of the, of the New Testament, the, the great ones are sort of fourth, fifth century manuscripts. We've got fragments from earlier. When you go to the Israel Museum, you're not looking at copies of the scrolls, you're looking at the scrolls themselves mm. and it's just like oh my goodness somebody in about 200 BC yeah. was writing these letters mm. that I am seeing here mm. oh. uh, and, and you can get all the Dead Sea Scrolls in one paperback edition in English translation and again the, com the community that produced the scrolls <laughs> is like a first cousin of Christianity as they too believed that Israel's God had kept his promises, had sent some sort of Messiah, we're not quite sure who that was, had renewed the covenant with them as a little secret group and was going to come back and force the issue and there would be a big battle and they would be the ones who would win, etc, etc. So there's lots of differences but lots of family resemblances as well. And so again getting to see how that worked out in, in a, a different community is, is very illuminating.
mm. all sorts of things like that. Mm. Um, so with, with all your experience and what you've learned over the years, Tom, and for the homeschooling parents listening now, is there anything else you would like to say to them to help equip them to do their job? It, 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 is, a, it is a huge question and having never been a homeschooler myself I'm sort of looking over the fence at other people doing it rather than talking from first-hand experience. I, I think to get children to read as widely as possible, whether it's the novels of Walter Scott, whether it's Shakespeare, whether it's the ancient Roman world, whether it's medieval tales, the, the, the habit of reading. Archbishop Michael Ramsey was once asked how he managed to keep up his reading when he was Archbishop, and he said, it, it's like an alcoholic with his drink. He said, little and often and secretly. <laughs> you know, he would, would disappear into a room, and it's just, it was because there was a book there, and he was halfway through, and he wanted to read the next chapter. But that sense of as though reading was a vice, in fact it isn't, but, but so something secret, oh, yeah, I, can, I can get into that world again. And the, the danger with so much academic study is that a lot of academic books are boring. They're kind of technical stuff. And you've got to be able to do the technical stuff. But, I mean, just next door to where we're sitting, there is this shop called Black Horse. <laughs> Fancy living within walking distance of a shop like that. I go in there and every other book there, I, I, want, I want to have read it. I want to have absorbed it. And, knowing that at home I've got a pile of books on one table and a pile of books on my desk and there's no point buying more just I'm too old I'll never read them all but um, to have that desire is, is, is really important back to the first century for one thing particularly which I've been increasingly impressed by the older I've got there's a fascinating coincidence and I use that word advisedly in the first century BC, when Augustus became emperor following the civil wars, following the death of Julius Caesar, etc., Augustus got his court poets like Virgil and Ovid and Horace to write works which were telling the story of Rome as a long story which had now reached its climax with the arrival of this new imperial rule. Simultaneously, and there's no evidence that they knew about this, the Jews were living in a story which had a long backstory, waiting for something to happen which would bring their story to its glorious uh, new, new day, but they didn't know what it was going to look like. When the early Christians tell the story of Jesus, they are building off that Jewish story in order to say, here's the great story from Abraham, blah, 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 David, the prophets, exile, restoration, all of that. And now here is Jesus, who is the Kyrios Cosmo, the Lord of the world, which is a phrase that Caesar might have used about himself. Now, again, there is no sense that the Jewish tradition is getting this from Rome, because the Jewish tradition is rooted in Isaiah and Daniel and Ezekiel, etc., way before Rome was writing this stuff. So you've got these two strands. And I think this is part of what Paul means when he says, when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son. So for anyone wanting to understand early Christianity, to get to know the Roman world, the world in which this story was being told, which turns out to be a parody of the true story, that's really, really important and would teach people then to start listening to the stories that are being told in our world whether it's the stories being told in the movies or by politicians or the new novelists or today's poets, to understand the culture of how these stories work and then to think prayerfully about how the Christian story addresses those stories and accepts all that is good and positive and wise in them but says, nevertheless, this larger story takes you where you really need to go. So. For me, those two tasks, understanding how the first century worked, understanding our task as apologists in the 21st century, those are very closely related. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, thank yeah. you, thank you. If you could time travel, Tom, <laughs> <laughs> 
Is there anything you would do different from when you were young and you get a sense of your vocation? Is there anything that you would do differently? Oh, goodness, goodness. It's, it's a funny one because I do sometimes think when I'm walking around Oxford, looking at the Bodleian Library just through there, I should have spent more time in there. <laughs> because I was singing in a choir and playing in an orchestra and playing rugby and <laughs> squash and goodness knows what else. And I, I had a wonderful time as a student, but I, I wish I had dived more deeply into the primary texts. When I then went to study at seminary, just up the road in Wycliffe Hall, I realised that this is the real thing. And I, I just dived as deep as I could, as long as I could, as hard as I could. And I suppose looking back at my teenage years, I'm sure as teenagers we all wasted a heck of a lot of time. Mm. Um, I, I wish I had got more Shakespeare under my belt at that stage. I wish I had read more of the great classics, the Greco-Roman classics at that stage. I did a fair amount, but um, looking back, there are all sorts of things I could have done. But then I also wish that I'd um, practiced the piano more. <laughs> um, you know, so one, 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 one can't always be doing everything. And, and there were many things that I did while wasting time, whether it was practicing slip fielding as a cricketer or whatever, which actually probably were very good for me and kept me alert and awake um, rather than being boring and one-dimensional. So, yeah, probably a lot of things, but, but I think, you know, particularly in a television culture, a visual age culture, in a declining attention span culture, the more we can train the next generation to have a longer attention span, to be reading rather than relying on you know, uh, screens all the time. Mm -hmm. And th there's a new book just out by Jonathan Haidt, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read it, but I've seen reviews mm -hmm. all about you know, how yeah. we all spend time doing this. Yeah. Here we are sitting here with screens in front of us. <laughs> no, no, quite, quite. But um, my wife and I laugh at each other because we, we, we both do this, you know. We yeah. come in from a trip and we instantly just see who's getting in touch and what's going on in the world. I think there are major cultural things like that which need addressing and we can't just assume that they're getting addressed. There is a whole generation growing up which, according to Jonathan Haidt, is, is an unhappy generation. Mm -hmm and part of the unhappiness is what's coming through the screens. Did, what, was it Bill Gates or somebody who, somebody said, you know, these machines are uh, addictive. Mm. And he said, um, yeah, we designed them to be addictive. Right. <laughs> you said they don't let their own children have them, apparently. Uh, I think that's, yes, quite, quite, mm. quite. Yeah, th there are mistakes that we make. It'd be nice to think that the next generation might be steered off some of them. But um, that's, that's easier said than done. <laughs> Which kind of brings us around to where we started. The next generation do have opportunities. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But actually, yes, I was talking to a colleague yesterday um, who's a retired professor from St Andrews and we, we knew them when we were up there. They were down in Oxford, we had lunch with them. And talking about carrying on with one's research while in retirement. Mm -hmm. and, and he said to me, he said, of course, some things are much easier these days because almost all the secondary literature I want is online. Mm -hmm. These days, journal articles are online. You used to have to go to the library and order something up from the stack and wait around and finally get to read this article. Now it's just, it's right there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're in a glut of information. Instead of mm -hmm. having to scratch around to find things, there's so much coming at us the whole time. Um, and that, that's, that's a real problem, that there was a time not that long ago when in my field it was more or less possible for an assiduous scholar to read all the major stuff, all the commentaries on a particular biblical book, all the key articles, etc. I, I think that's not possible now. There's just so much stuff out there. I mean, we used to confine ourselves to English, French, and German. Mm. There was plenty of stuff in Spanish, in Italian, in Russian, in Japanese, which we you know, didn't read. But these days, even in English, stuff is flooding out all the time. Perhaps that's something that also needs to be addressed, is how do you assist 
strategically minded people to draw up a very focused priority list. Yeah. It's like that mind map thing. You have to start off with the obvious things and then see where they'll lead you. But be prepared for the sudden jolt which says, actually, you're really going to have to focus on this one and just leave those to one side. So I've said to my students again and again, and I would say this to people through their teens if they're grubbing around in a school library or whatever, there's no way you can know ahead of time which are going to be the really valuable things for you. No, no, no logical way. For me, it's a matter of prayer and discernment and at a sort of more lowly level, sheer guesswork <laughs> and, and trial and error. When I, when I think back, I mean, one of your previous questions, I remember when I was doing my doctorate, I would find a book that seemed very relevant and I would spend days reading carefully through, taking copious notes mm. without really understanding what the book was about because I was so concerned to take detailed notes so that I would have them on my, in my... And then I'd have to read my notes to find out what the book was about. Yeah. And for me, one of the great steps forward was one time when I had a nasty dose of flu and as I was recovering from it and was just starting to be able to sit up and sip hot lemons and start reading again, I couldn't take notes while I was doing that. And there were two or three books that I knew I needed to read that I just read as if they were novels without taking any notes. And I realized by reading them much faster, I had actually understood what the chap was saying much more than if I'd been going through page by page taking detailed notes. And in fact, looking back now, some of those files of detailed notes just stayed in my filing cabinet. <laughs> so learning how, okay, it's, it's discerning from quite early on in a book or an article, is this deserving of two days work or two weeks work or two minutes work? And maybe guessing wrong, and you may have to go back, but in principle assume that you need to be able to get the general drift of something as soon as you can. These days they publish articles with an abstract, which helps, mm -hmm. you can see. And then you can cut the article quite quickly. Oh, I see, you're saying that, you're in, in dialogue with that scholar, you're making this point. Well, that's really interesting, I need to check that out. Thank you very much, two minutes, done. Other times, oh my goodness, this is a whole different way of reading that text. I need to go through very carefully with the text out on the desk and, and then go for a long walk around the parks and think about it and scratch my head and come back and take some more notes. But discerning the proper response, again, it's a very personal thing and there's no easy rules, but at least realizing that those different choices are open is a major thing, otherwise people feel guilty if they've just skim, skim read something. They haven't taken that seriously. And the answer is it may not deserve to be taken seriously, or, or not by you at the moment. You know, maybe you'll come back to it in 10 years' time. But, um, <laughs> so, but, but being prepared to have the flexibility to make those decisions as you go along. Mm, that's also very good advice. Tom, you have just given us, and anyone listening, just a wonderful gift <laughs> of your experience and thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you for the coffee. <laughs> I will link in the description box where to find Tom Wright's books. Earlier I said I would include his response on courage as I wanted him to reflect on the friction he has experienced in the Christian church. Here is his response. Courage isn't something I think about in the abstract, as it were. It's just that I have found myself faced over the years with a variety of tasks, some complicated, some demanding, some in some ways threatening. When that's so, I find the Psalms infinitely sustaining. Praying the Psalms day by day is, after all, one of the oldest Christian traditions, and again and again in my life, I wouldn't know how to do without them. And of course, the Psalms direct us again and again back to God as our rock and fortress. That doesn't make tasks necessarily easier, but it means I have been able to take a deep breath and have a go at whatever it is. <laughs>